Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'd like to welcome you all to the panel today on intersex advocacy in Australia and New Zealand. We've got some um, fantastic activists and uh, researchers here to talk today about their experiences um, in this space in Australia and New Zealand. So I'd like to start by introducing the various panelists here. Um, I'm gonna start by introducing Steph Lum. Steph is an intersex advocate and legal researcher. She's based on Ngunnawal and Ngambri country in Australia. And she's the founder of Youth and I, an intersex youth creative arts anthology. Welcome Steph. Um, I'd like to next introduce Georgia Andrews. Georgia is based in Wellington, Aotearoa, New Zealand. She's a United Nations LGBTIQ plus women's rights defender, a global intersex peer support facilitator, and she's also a stakeholder manager for Youth and I, working with Steph. Jelly O'Shea, uh, welcome Jelly. Jelly works for Intersex Aotearoa and holds an executive role on the Intersex Peer Support Australia Board. Jelly is a queer Pakahan intersex person living on the lands of Te Atiawa in Te Whanganui Akara in Wellington, Aotearoa, New Zealand. Sorry for mangling that pronunciation. Welcome, Jelly. Bonnie Hart is an intersex woman, a peer, wo peer worker, and systemic advocate working with and within the intersex community for improved access to legislative protections, affirmative rights-based healthcare and mental health services. Bonnie is the designer of Interlink, a peer-led and community-based intersex psychosocial support program. And she's also the current secretary of Intersex Peer Support Australia. And finally, I'd like to introduce Morgan Carpenter. Morgan is a bioethicist and an intersex human rights defender working on Bundjalung country. Morgan has lived experience. Morgan has changed the face of intersex, intersex advocacy globally and locally. In 2013, he designed and shared the intersex flag now used across the world. And it's framed around concepts of bodily integrity and autonomy. In that same year, he became president of Intersex Human Rights Australia. Morgan has been contracted or uh, contracted or on reference groups for the UN, the ACT government, the Australian Human Rights Commission, the Australian Bureau of Statistics, the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare, New South Wales Health, and many more. So welcome Morgan and all. I'd like to start the process by asking each of you in turn to uh, share a little bit about the work you do. And then we'll turn to some questions, uh, which will be led uh, answers will be led by particular activists. So what I'd like each of you to do in turn, if possible, is to share something about the work that you do. And if it's relevant to your answer, something about the importance of law reform and policies in the region that you work within. Could we start with Steph, please? Thanks, Aileen. Um, the main Thing that I do now is um, working at Youth and I, so as its editor in chief. And Youth and I is um, an intersex youth anthology. So we um, are in our third issue at the moment, and um, essentially collating stories and of writings and artwork by young intersex people about age thirty and younger from around the world. So it's really about helping to elevate intersex voices. Um, and encouraging their creative output. Um, and I also work with Georgia, who's on this talk um, in that project. Um, in relation to law reform, based here in the ACT, there's a big um, reform happening at the moment with the development of um, a bill to protect intersex people. So I've been involved in that process um, in terms of helping to consult um, with the government officers working on it. So. Um, hopefully that will come to fruition very soon and very closely involved in the development of that here. Thank you, Steph. Um, <clears throat> Georgia, maybe we'll turn to you and you can also speak to some extent about your involvement with Youth and I. 
Kia ora. So I'm the stakeholder manager at Euphanize. So I work very closely with Steph and um, key part of my role is engaging with intersex youth from across the globe uh, to support young people to be able to contribute often for the first time their lived stories and lived experiences. Um, and a really exciting element of that process is enabling the young people to uh, contribute their works in their native language. Kia ora. Thank you. Bonnie, can we turn to you and maybe hear something about the work that you're currently engaged with? Thanks, uh, Eileen. Yeah, the work I do at, currently at the moment, I suppose most of the work that I do has stemmed out of an initial expression of my lived experience and then trying to meet other people um, who have had similar types of experiences or have similar types of bodies. From there, I've kind of progressively tried to, I like, to address some of the significant gaps in services that we keep on stumbling over in, in peer spaces um, and identifying those and trying to create workarounds through either directly um, engaging with government and non-government organisations to improve the um, affirmative nature and rights-based frameworks that they're using to work with people with intersex variations and the parents of kids with variations in sex characteristics and also to the point of um, designing our own peer-led and community-based programs that uh, actively try to address those issues and provide some level of service that actually um, can meet the need. I also am really dedicated to developing community spaces and um, the culture of intersex community groups and do this through, um, you know, putting together events and supporting uh, um, peer-led organisations to try and improve kind of um, kind of social connections and those kind of referral pathways that can flow out from that into larger intersex networks. Thanks, Bonnie. Um, I'll turn now to Jelly. Thank you. Um, kia ora everyone. So nice to be here. Um, I was just reflecting on how all of you have had an effect to me being here and continuing the work I do. So that's so nice. Um, so yeah, I work for Intersex Aotearoa. So we're the only intersex-led organisation in New Zealand that um, aims to do quite a lot um, in, term in terms of like education, advocacy, uh, referral. We will be launching a peer support program this year. Um, we've been sort of formally uh, for some time an organisation started by Marnie Bruce Mitchell, um, purely an advocacy and activist organisation. So we're moving into trying to balance um, community generation and peer support um, with those really inspired by values that Bonnie shared with us as well, which is so wonderful. Um, so yeah, I'm the only employee um, that's intersex at the moment, and we've got an intersex-led board, but it sort of means that I work across lots of different projects um, with, yeah, other peer organisations that might be working in health advocacy or in rainbow spaces and with government as well. Um, and in terms of, of policy, that is um, still a... A challenging area in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, so our main base is trying to get um, an amendment in the human rights legislation here um, with our current Labour government, fingers crossed. Um, we'll keep banging on that door or on the biscuit tin that the bill is currently sitting in, but I won't get into New Zealand archaic parliamentary processes for now. But um, Yes. Uh, in the meantime, we will be working with um, our health body on new guidelines for um, healthcare practitioners um, with a bunch of other amazing intersex advocates and, I guess, allies. So, yeah, I think that's a good place for me to pass on to someone else. Thanks. Fantastic. Thanks, Jelly. And now I'm going to finish with Morgan and... Um ask you to tell us something about the work that you, you're doing. Thank you, Aileen. Um, and it's, it's great to hear all, all the uh, stories. And of course, there are big connections or significant connections, I think, between all of us and, and longstanding collaborations between many of us as well. Um, 
like other people, I think um, I have fundamentally been trying to help to grow an Australian and an international intersex community um, and try to identify and develop a, a common platform that, that can address our health, legal, human rights, psychosocial support um, and research needs. Um, and try and develop the legislation and the institutional infrastructure uh, that can support those needs and respect the circumstances of a really diverse population. So I think that what that means is really very much a focus on building community, on evidence, on capacity, on education and resources. Um, and it's been a pleasure to work with all of you, I think. Um, so it's good to be here with you talking today. There's some exciting, fantastic things happening. Um, in Australia, New Zealand, around intersex advocacy and human rights. So I wanted to turn now to um, talking about the importance of sharing stories about lived experience um, as an intersex person. And what are some of the costs of doing that, of sharing stories with others? And maybe have you found any ways in which to negotiate this safely? So I'm going to start, turn to you first, Georgia to speak to that question i have quite a unique perspective being the second out intersex activist in aotearoa to speak publicly uh, about being intersex and mani bruce mitchell you know founded conversations and really set a foundation uh, for me to be able to talk about uh, my experiences so i really want to thank mani for that tireless work uh, for me what i have realized in my um, communications with public is often that's captured in writing or in film and that gets put online and it's spread everywhere and it's impossible to control how that spreads and that can be okay in the moment but as someone who's been in pretty consistent advocacy for five years looking back at some of the materials that were published five years ago the terminology or my viewpoints on community and connection are quite outdated and sadly, that content circulates. So I think it's important to have um, not only regular communications updating you know, thoughts and processes within our community, but also having a varied mix of intersex people speaking so that voices that are shared in the community aren't just one person um, in a bit of an echo chamber, which I sometimes feel like that can be. And it's a reason why I choose to actively take breaks from speaking about my story to allow other people to step up. So not being caught like a fly in amber within a view you might have had uh, five or ten years ago. Absolutely. And I think even we mentioned earlier around you know, terminology and you know, we have communities that um, use intersex as a, a common term, others that don't. Variations of sex characteristics terminology has come in in recent years. And it's all of those niche components to our storytelling that can really influence both people's understanding of our communities, um, but also whether or not they feel like they belong. Mm. Mm. Jelly, I might ask you to um, respond to that as well. Mm, thank you, Georgia. That was really interesting, nuanced points. Um, yeah, I was thinking about this question in terms of what sort of what Bonnie was talking about before in terms of like our like intersex culture and how we um, talk about our lived experiences because a lot of the work we do ends up um, being centered and talking about harm and trauma. And so if you're sort of yeah, you're stuck in that space a lot and you have lived experience in that. It's a it's a heavy weight for us. Um, and I feel like I came into a culture that was um, somewhat established internationally um, that to make change was really about pushing our personal stories and, and there was some kind of maybe like some unsaid pressure or expectations around that being one way that change really could happen. And um I'm I'm really conscious of of like emotional well being a lot more now, and also about what sort of what modelling we're doing 
for each other in the future. Some of those things I think is quite fascinating to think about um, of how we can influence that and not put pressure on anyone to share stories. Um, and like Georgia said, they're out there. Um, and though it's true, you can really mobilize people into doing more research and, and being sort of woken up to the realities of what's still occurring in healthcare practices in Australia and New Zealand. Um, I think there's ways that we can go about um, using vehicles for that knowledge that don't have to be so personally impactful. Uh, yeah, so I think there's still a lot more conversation that we can do as communities about looking after ourselves and each other when we when we do choose to share. And you know, and there's going to be some times where you go, "This is a great, this is a great opportunity for me to do that." And I checked in with myself, and I feel feel good about that or maybe I'm going to just share a little bit and not the whole shebang um yeah so those are some of those thoughts that I think of when um we talk about sharing our lived experiences yeah. sort of taking time to reflect and consider possible impacts thank you so much does anybody else want to add to that yeah I mean I think that, that there is a significant cost to telling our own stories, and that, and that's not only having very intimate details about your body in the public domain, which is what what Georgia has mentioned, um, but also the trauma of retelling your story. Because, I mean, for me and and for many of us, I think um, diagnosis is wrapped up in a bundle of really awful traumatic uh, experiences about not only diagnosis but also surgeries and uh, relationship breakup and a whole range of other issues that, that are really difficult to unpack and, and that I have to reassemble them uh, every time I try and uh, pull myself together after talk, talk, telling about my story. Um, and I also think it's important that we try and move beyond having to rely on the personal trauma as a way to try and achieve change. We, we want to try and move our community beyond trauma uh, and to a place where people feel able to uh, share, I don't know, that, that share survivorship and thriving together and flourishing and, and and that's difficult to do what when all of the models and all of the stories are about trauma mm. um, I don't really have any good answers on how to achieve that apart from looking you know at, at the support that we give to youth and I um, about ways in which people can share incredible you know poetry and art and creativity uh, and I think that's maybe a really good starting point for that. It's also an excellent segue into talking about Youth and I, which is the next question that I was going to talk about, how the publication of Youth and I has engaged the voices of the international community of younger people with intersex variations to allow people to engage in creative ways uh, to share their story instead of engaging what Cody's just referred to as trauma porn. Maybe, Steph, you could uh, start by... You can lead the discussion on that question. Yeah, I think um, it's something I'm, and I'll speak for Georgia and say Georgia as well, incredibly proud of um, what we've done with Youth and I and being able to reach out internationally as well to draw on so many different people and help support them to share their own stories. Um, and it's really very open as to what people want to share and how they share it. So there, there doesn't need to be this focus on trauma. In fact, a lot of the um, the pieces that we receive are very much focused on, um, you know, overcoming um, difficulties in their lives and finding other people and finding community and healing. Um, and so that's been a really positive and powerful way to share some of these other narratives. Um, and also because I think we spend so much time, you know, editing this content with the contributors, it means that people can kind of feel supported in that process of sharing what they want to be able to share and not just feel really pressured in the moment to just say something that they might later regret. Um, and 
you know, we make sure that we work closely with them to then publish stuff that they're happy with. So I think, you know, we've seen that a lot of people who have contributed have contributed in future issues and well, as well, um, and just a lot of positive feedback about the whole thing. So I really hope that it's been quite an empowering process for the people involved in it. Um, and something that we've done in the last two issues is um, engage translators as well. So we're able to um, reach out to people who don't speak English as a first language or who aren't as confident um, sharing words in English so that we can support everyone because the movement um, can be a bit limiting to access to people who don't have English as a first language. So, you know, we're doing what we can to help support as many voices as possible. And um, it's been really nice to just be able to be part of that and support that process. Georgia, do you have anything else to say on that? I just echo everything that you've mentioned, Steph, but for me, I think it's the impact of uh, a lot of intersex young people hearing stories of other intersex young people for the first time. You know, some people who have engaged with us have been in you know, late teens, early 20s. So for me, that's a profound thing to know that this publication has supported that change and the Amplifying community. Yeah, it's fantastic. It's a great publication. Um, you should be proud of it. Um, maybe we could move on to the next issue about how you uh, maintain the balance um, that is required in your work as an intersex advocate. For So how do you maintain authenticity? I mean, Morgan, you were talking about having to retell and retell your personal experiences in a way that can be quite traumatising. So how do you remain authentic and still hold specific expertise in the field of work that you're in? I might turn to uh, Georgia to address that. I think you know, our communities are small, so our advocate and activist communities are small, so we are known qu quite openly to uh, key people in our countries, whether that be politicians or key medics, when we're trying to get into rooms to influence change. For me, you know, sort of segueing back a little bit to storytelling, um, it can be easy for me to feel lost in those conversations where you're advocating for other people and you can sometimes forget about your own needs. Mm -hmm. uh, I used to tell my story in full depth and that would be the center point for my discussions in those professional settings. But I now use that more as an anchor point to remind myself and to remind the room of why I'm there. You know, I have had experiences which have influenced me to want to come and support my community to see better outcomes. Um, but um, I guess for me, I have also taken uh, quite a formal step back to create space. So I did have um, a, a chair role at Intersex Aotearoa and I decided that, you know, for my mental health, as well as to let other people step up, I would separate from that space. Bonnie, did you um, want to speak to that as well? valuable to hear about your experiences yeah I I think you know I I agree like creating space like that there's there is a, a real phenomena that happens when you start to talk about your lived experience in this framework and it can be an incredibly empowering and self-discovering space do you know like often we don't have the opportunity to even start to talk about the um kind of intersectional experiences that we've had and how they have impact the various areas of our life and different services that we come in contact with um and that can be really great for a really short period of time <laughs> or for like a, a longer period of time but actually um it can become um yeah it can become very taxing actually uh, uh, um for for that while i, I think what's important in terms of balancing um, lived experiencing versus expertise is that is recognizing that lived experiences are expertise and often lived experiences are still so important because they point the finger to the questions that should be being asked before they've been asked by larger organizations or academics or people who are invested in the status quo systems that the us of, as advocates are trying to draw attention to and affect change to make them more suitable for people um, 
who who have to live in the bodies that those that those services are targeted towards. It's also about knowing, um, knowing your worth and knowing what lived experience means in terms in service provision. So most service providers have a mandate either through their own professional guidelines or um, through their own professional development to understand communities that they work with. Um, hospitals have a really large consumer program where they bring people's voices in and they're very important in terms of policy decisions and policy directions as are the role of peers in the delivery of multiple different health services. So um, this inherently is working with those power dynamics in those spaces and peer experiences are about trying to use people's lived experience to facilitate um, engagement with health and mental health services or social services. So there really is a symbiosis and trying to, um, I think the real difficulty comes about when there's a clash between those two viewpoints or the two epistemological frameworks one being like this is how the business is done here and then as a peer with lived experience sometimes based that and trauma coming into that space and going well we're trying to work with changing that because it's not actually working with the service delivery that can be really hard and I suppose the only only option in those places is to look at what the common points of that and really that comes down to identifying whether you're a service provider or a service user, what is the best outcome that we want in that scenario for the people in that space and how do we achieve that? And generally focusing on those common areas is a really great way to ensure that um, both expertise, all expertise in the space are honoured. Such an important issue. Um, Morgan, did you want to add to that? Well, I think uh, I, I would agree with what's been said, really. Um, I, I think that um, there, there is a real tension between having lived experience and being an expert. And it's something that I felt very much as I've um, not only been doing this work for so long, like for more than a decade, but, but also um, I've become more of an expert academically as well. Um, and I, I struggle with situations where people expect you to come in and tell your story while other people make sense of it mm -hmm. um, as experts. And I'm not never willing for that to happen. Um, and trying to balance the... Um, the, the, the role of being an expert with lived experience, I think can be challenging for other people because of that. Um, because if you combine both, then that can sometimes, I think particularly for marginalized communities that are poorly understood like ours, it can make you appear suspect in some way. It can make people question your judgment in ways that, that you know, we, we know that, that you know, women, of course, are going to have things to say about women's health um, that are important and vital. And we know that, that um, you know, other marginalised populations have to be able to speak up about health and human rights concerns. And, and we're, not, we're just the same. It's just that people don't understand what it is that we're bringing to the table very often. Um, so, yeah, so I find it a difficult well, the medical model so reifies, sort of, uh, I guess, more dismisses uh, lived experiences, sort of anecdotal, and um, and 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 you know, fails to acknowledge um, the real expertise of people with lived experience in that sense, sort of almost systemically and institutionally. I think that's a really good point, Hayley. And I think that probably many of us have been in situations where, where our personal story has been dismissed as an anecdote by somebody in a position of authority who wants to make a very different point or, or suggest that our experiences are unusual. Um, and I can see people nodding. <laughs> Did anybody want to um, address that issue more? 
or should we move on to the next point that we're going to talk about, which is the importance of community-led organizations. And I think that ties in really well with that previous question that at how to make community-led organizations um, give them more resources, more power to provide services to the community. And, and, and how does this sit alongside the advocacy work that you guys are doing? So maybe we could start with you, Gillian, to lead that, that discussion. Yeah, thank you. I feel like um, this is something I think about a lot, but, um, you know, I'm about to embark in pivoting an organization from a kind of purely advocacy space into one that's formally doing peer support. I mean, of course, we've been doing peer support this whole time, but um, I think not in a really public, accessible mode. Uh, one thing I think a lot about a lot is um, if we are sort of integrating community-led that we are giving people a way to engage when they want to engage and also absolutely have space when they want space. And, you know, we're a small community that's heavily consulted, um, it, like more so over the past three years than um, I think ever. <laughs> um, and lots of that intention is really positive. Um, there's a lot of um, interest in our voices, but, um, you know, how do we make that sustainable when there's, a, you know, a small number of people that are um, that are out and are willing to speak to um, and give input into different legislation or submissions or um, projects? Um, and, you know, I'm always really conscious about not um, overusing people um, and, and how do we actually, like, do what Bonnie's talking about of like community creation how do we let people just be with each other like how do we learn how to be with each other if there's always um an impetus to be almost creating a product you know um and it's it's almost like that capitalist framework of of you know squeezing the most out of us um and so that can be confusing when you're here to make change right because there is a pace to that that's like you know incremental stuff is a very um it's it's intertwined and incre inc incremental change is intertwined in what we do but also of course we want to um we want people to learn faster do better um you know we're pushing that all the time um so yeah there's there's something there around letting um people with intersex variations um, engage and be and and practice community, um, but not also a trajectory of all people that are interested in this area because of their lived experience. They don't need to become advocate advocates and do what we're doing, because um, it's it's hard it's hard work. Hey, eh? like I I um I and I have to stop myself. You know, in all honesty, I have to stop like myself from just wanting to mobilize everyone. So yeah. I, Again, a lot of nods and, and um, <laughs> recognition around, around the screens. Yeah, more... I mean, sorry, I was just going to say, you want you want to invite everyone to the party. It's just um, whether it's actually always a fun time or not. <laughs> <laughs> Morgan, could you speak to that as well? Uh, well, I mean, I, I agree with Jelly. I mean, I, I, I think there's a lot of there are lots of nodding heads in, in, in the space. Uh, it, it's difficult building community and building organisations. Um, you know, we were in a a context where we are wildly misunderstood uh, by many different um, vested interests. Um, where where the meaning that people ascribe to our experiences is wildly different um, from many of the lived experiences that we have. Um, and we're in a situation as well where many different vested interests want to or believe they can speak on our behalf. Um, and I think one of the tasks that we've done, I think, that is one of the most significant, I think, in our region, is, is come together for the Darlington retreat, where we agreed a common platform 
Um, but I think really for the first time in our region, set out a, a shared agenda. Um, and, you know, it's not perfect and, and, and it is part of its time. But the things that it says are actually setting the agenda for the work that's happening now in the ACT and elsewhere, including not only um, the idea of protections of people's bodily autonomy in hospitals, but the concept of oversight and the attention that is being given to psychosocial support. Um, so the, these concepts didn't come from nowhere. They came out of our discussions together about what it is that we want to see happen. Uh, and, and I think that, again, the, the process wasn't perfect, but we literally brought together everybody that we knew in our two countries that we knew were active and, and that could work with each other. Um, and it brought together some very different perspectives on how we should be understood. Uh, and um, yeah, so I think that bringing together people, um, creating a common agenda or common platform, um, I think it's, it's been foundational to the work that we do, even though it took us a long time to get there. Um, and yeah, uh, and it's difficult work, it's long, slow work. Trying to get that platform implemented is already five years of work. Um, even to get it understood and, um, you know, publicised and understood by allies, as well as um, policy makers and governments. So, I mean, it's an incredibly key resource in that respect, because as you say, there's just so much misunderstanding um, and misinterpretation. So the Darlington Statement provides such a clear, um, you know, a clear foundation. Did anybody else want to speak to that? I think it's such an interesting point. I, I have, I suppose, um, to my mind, um, the intersex movement has always been a synthesis between peer support and and human rights advocacy. Do you know, uh, peer support groups and our groups are actually the launching pad for so many advocates, particularly upon hearing the same types of systemic issues and causes of harm surface in peer discussions of lived experiences. Um, and then our peer spaces being turned into um, discussions about how to improve services or how to actually um, live with those types of experiences or bodies. And equally speaking, we've heard here tonight how difficult the work of intersex advocacy and activism is on us as individuals with lived experience. So we very much need access to community. We need access to support in order to help um, to help ground that energy and also to keep ourselves relevant in terms of the types of things that we're advocating for. So really it's a two-way relationship. And it, it's one of the reasons that why peer-led services and community-led organisations are so important to be funded and they're so important to be delivering the services that are directed towards people with intersex lived experiences. Um, this is a, a, an important thing because otherwise we are um, educating other more powerful and well-funded structures to be able to deliver services to us that then doesn't have the level of accountability to community that um, that we have as community-led organisations. For example, Interlink, the program that I run, the Intersex Psychosocial Support Program, brings together mental health workers and intersex peer support workers to co-design and co-deliver group-based interventions with people. But having the peer workers in there and having like a, a community based peer advisory group around the program um, enables us to be able to connect people through our international networks of peers with people on the other side of the world who might have similar types of bodies to people um, who, you know, people in our groups might never have met someone with their particular intersex variations. And we're much more adept at our our community-based organisations are much more adept at being able to link people together um, 
sometimes locally and sometimes internationally. And clinical spaces, because of their short-based frameworks and their, um, their overarching objectives, aren't so well placed in order to be able to do a lot of the work that is really needed to um, safeguard intersex well-being and mental health over the long term. Mm -hmm. But again, it's it's about resourcing as well. And, and like in terms of funding, and we've done so much work to try and elevate the status of our, our um, intersex-led organisations and the robustness of our of our groups to be able to deliver these types of services um, and also to stand alongside other much more well-funded organisations, um, including government departments, uh, to be able to have an equal voice in terms of that type of service delivery. Yeah, fantastic points, everyone. Um, so for our final issue, um, I was wondering if we could talk a little bit about kind of succession planning, how community organizations can develop and mentor younger, newer activists. Again, this is a theme that's run through all the discussion we've had before and, and ensuring sustainable practices, sustainable working experiences for intersex advocates. Um, I might call on you, Bonnie, to, to, to lead the discussion on that point. Yeah. Well, it is a pleasure and a challenge at the time at the same time to be someone that has been engaged with um, an intersex led organization for um, a decade or so yeah. um, and to have been publicly speaking about intersex um, stuff for such a long time. It, it's really in terms of like learning the impacts of doing that, but then also, um, having had the experiences of trying to do so very much to address the many gaps in services with so very little and having that feeling that there was no one else to be able to hand over stuff to and not being able to really set very good boundaries because the work is so important and we're so invested in it. Saying no to some some opportunities is incredibly difficult, even if we're already stretched in our capacity. Um, but that's not something that you know from the get-go. That's only something that you learn after running dry. Um, and that's one of the really great resources, I suppose, that established um, voices in this space can provide to new voices and new people who are trying to enter this space. Um, because really the, you know, like the way back from burnout is much harder than not burning out in the first place. And it takes a lot longer to recuperate. And, um, you know, there's just some things you can't put back in your box. So this ties together most, lots of the things that we've been talking about today in terms of like, you know, pacing yourself, having a community that you can discuss what you might want to say publicly or what you might want to do before you actually go out and do it so you know what the implications might be. Um, and then and then there are very structural things that go along with that as well. Um, the capacity to have funded peer workers or the capacity to have funded staff to actually deliver some services or even check an email account is something that's only very recently available to some of our organisations in um, Australia or Aotearoa New Zealand. So um, that in itself has really hindered our capacity to be able to develop a peer workforce that is robust, that has really great capacity to be able to um, set good boundaries and have supervision and have access to psychological care when we need it or know that those are things that we should be looking at or know that like um you know we should be taking time away and engaging self-care and these types of things so we're getting much better in terms of developing these processes to ensure that our workplaces are self, like that they are workplaces. It's not just sitting around, not just the groups of people sitting around in their bedrooms at midnight, doom scrolling through texts and stuff like that. Like, so actually having some more robust systems um, really does enable us to have, um, perceive a, a, a much better future where people are actually like joining an intersex group in some way or another 
is a joy or is, is a pleasure and you know that it's going to feel safe and you know that it's going to um, meet your needs and it will be there should you want to walk away from it and come back later. You know it's going to be there. <laughs> and that that um, that's really a really great space to be in because, you know, we come from a space where we, we haven't known who's going to be running our groups in the past because it's we've been reliant on volunteers and been reliant on volunteers with lived experiences of trauma and um and engaging in in supporting others and working in spaces that are quite difficult so um i think uh our groups in australia have done so much with so very little in terms of the amount of resourcing that we've got and also the um the amount of interest and uh, um, support that we've gotten from various departments, organisations. So yeah. we're really at a great launching pad now to be able to really, um, really implement a really great, strong future in this way. Thanks so much, Bonnie. I, I really do feel like the, the future is looking really good at the moment. Um, and I think it's taken a long time to get there. I, mean, I think... You know, our region includes one of the oldest intersex led organizations in the world, if not the oldest. Yet, our organizations are run so much on a shoestring that, that they are incredibly fragile. And, mm -hmm. and uh, the amount of time and energy and effort that people have put in to organizations as volunteers is extraordinary and, and all of us have been there even those of us that, that are now paid all of us have worked uh, long unpaid hours to help our institutions to survive and grow and be where they are um so yeah so i think it's an incredibly important and valuable thing uh, and I hope that we're now at the point where we can begin to flourish as, as organisations. Um, I don't know if we're there yet, but maybe we are. Well, that, that change, that shift is obviously the result of um, many, many years of people putting in, you know, their heart and soul and long hours and blood, sweat and tears. So, well, it's time to wrap up. So I might ask everyone to maybe share some closing thoughts. Morgan, can we start with you? Um, I think I just gave a few, really. Um, I, I think that uh, I think that what's not visible is the kind of the hard yards that goes in to creating new organizations, new infrastructure, new ways of understanding ourselves that makes sense to us. Um, and um, certainly here in Australia, we have an opportunity with a federal government that is for the first time in over a decade, you know, or near a decade, we're willing to listen. Um, and we're now beginning to get the resources we need to deliver uh, some of the work and the support that our community needs. Um, so, yeah, it's a good, good moment to be in. Jelly, any closing thoughts? Um, just the usual script, actually, of um, stop changing or putting all the pressure or onus on intersex bodies to change and let's take um, broader social responsibility for everyone to learn about the beautiful um, like diversity and sex characteristics because yay, yay difference. Yay intersex. <laughs> Bonnie. Um, I'm really looking forward to what the um, what a more sound and structured future for our intersex-led organisations will, will be, and particularly in terms of elevating more marginalised voices, elevating the voices of children with variations in sex characteristics, hearing more from parents of uh, and um, young people, um, people 
um, of colour, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, people in refugee background, like all of the different other intersectionalities that happen um, to people as who have intersex bodies. <laughs> um, I think that that once those voices are centred as well, then we'll have even better systems. Yeah. Thank you. Georgia. I'm excited to know that there are a lot of young intersex people that are ready to start taking on roles of responsibility. And I'm really excited to see what succession pathways look like moving forward as our communities are hopefully better resourced and have the funding to balance advocacy and peer support. Wonderful, thank you. Stephanie. Um, I think it's been great to hear you know, how much things have changed here over the last few years, even in terms of just resourcing and the movement growing, but it still feels, you know, that it's all very precarious and that like things are moving in the right direction, but things could actually really change quite quickly. Um, so I think it's just important to be mindful of that. And there's still a lot of work that non-intersex people and organisations can do to help support that while we're getting momentum to help us keep going until we're actually in a more um, sustainable and stronger place um and I think we're just very lucky actually to have each other you know in Australia we actually have quite a lot of very public advocates and in Aotearoa New Zealand and we're, we're so lucky that we actually work quite closely together and I can't imagine how difficult it is in other regions of the world and other countries where you might be the only person um, speaking out publicly um, and how challenging that will be to gain any kind of movement on anything but also any kind of community support so um, just reflecting I think on, on how lucky we are actually here but also knowing how much work we have to do here how much more other people might also have to do elsewhere. Well said well thank you so much everyone for your incredible contributions to this discussion and of course to all the hard work you've been putting in over the years and um, we'll be um, opening up the discussion for uh, sorry opening up the floor for questions and answers on the actual day of this panel so we'll wrap it up for now thanks again